Well, <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much for allowing me to talk about this. And I first uh, must say that um, uh, I will not show much of studies. I have used common sense and my own brain. So I'm lowering the guard for you, Hans. Um, first, I also want to declare uh, I have a lot of conflicts, but uh, the um, conflict of interest here might be that I've done some consultations for physio control. So, I think uh, Jakob did a lot of work for me in the preceding talk. This is where we are at right now. We have been increasing the, the survival in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest because that's what we are talking about over the years. But now we have kind of found a plateau. And the thing is, what should we do to be able to uh, improve the outcome? That is the main issue at stake. And um, there are for sure a lot of things that we can do that we know, uh, as we have been uh, hearing from both Teresa and, and uh, Jakob also earlier. Um, but uh, I think, you know, in, when we talk about stay and play and scoop and run, I think this should be really replaced with, because I don't really favor scoop and run, even if that's the topic that I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, I'm lowering the guard uh, once again, uh, but it will come up, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, I think it should be replaced with uh, treat and transport uh, because uh, nowadays we have a little bit more um, possibilities to do the continuous treatment not only on site for the patients but we can do it meanwhile we're transporting the patient into the hospital. I'm also favoring uh, a more individualized care because I think we have reached um, uh, that now. However, I know that this requires a lot of, of education and, and, and um, efforts. So, who should we treat and transport? Is it for everybody? No. I don't think so. Definitely not. I think it is for certain target groups. And I will, here you see I mentioned three of them, refractory cardiac arrest, hypothermia, and intoxications. This is the groups that I think we should at least consider to be a little bit soft. And what is a refractory cardiac arrest? Most of us maybe think about that it's uh, VF patients that are not responders on the scene. However, it could also be included, if you want, uh, the assistant and PA patients that don't respond immediately while treating on the scene. Is this really a problem? Do we have any patients that, are, that we should be concerned about? Yes, I would say so. Uh, for some years ago, when we started to talk about eCPR, I, did, um, I contacted uh, Johan Herlitz for the Swedish... Uh, cardiac arrest registry, and we uh, looked through the um, uh, statistics for um, the year 2013 and 14, and we were aiming at uh, what we defined refractory cardiac arrest as witnessed, patients that got CPR within five minutes, and uh, age group be be below 65. I mean, this could be debated, should we just aim at 65? I'm closing up, I mean, I'm 60 this year, so I'm getting a little bit nervous, but maybe it's not worth, you know, resuscitating me. Anyway, we found that in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest population, uh, there were about 14% nearly that kind of um, could belong to that group of patients. And in the in-hospital cardiac arrest registry that was um, at that time also uh, there, at about 20%. I also got some figures from Jakob that is very eager to now start with um, eCPR. And we discussed that a lot together. But you, you did some calculations based upon um, Stockholm data, and then we extrapolated it over to Sweden. And you can also, but this is just based upon Sweden, but if you then consider that we have uh, 
about 400 millions in Europe and 400 millions in the United States. We can just multiply these figures. But the question is, can we save their lives? You were saying that we were going to aim at 20%. I think it's fine. I don't think everybody's salvageable. We shouldn't save everybody's life either. I think it's a rather good way to have an exodus with a cardiac arrest. However, in the hospital, we have things that we can um, do. We can do further diagnostics. For example, if you have an occluded uh, coronary artery, if you have a pulmonary embolism, if you have a pneumothorax, etc., etc., that could be a little bit terrific, ter uh, tricky to do on the scene. There are interventions available, immediate coronary angiography and a possible PCI. And we know that time is muscle, so we need to come to that possibility timely. There are European recommendations nowadays, at least, that we should do an immediate coronary angiography on the patients that have an ST elevation AMI on the e first EKG. That is for sure recommended. But that's extrapolated knowledge from, from um, uh, studies with acute myocardial infarction. But the patients that don't have these EKG uh, signs of an acute M M AMI, we know less about. We know that if you look at registered data, they have about 30% of them have an occluded artery. So that's why I don't have a picture of that, but I just want to do some advertisements here. We are doing the DISCO trial. Uh, as you mentioned also, where we're randomizing these patients without ST elevation, the first EKG of the ROSC, to either immediate coronary angiography or to um, regular care. And we have also the ECMO thing. But I think also after ROSC, it's important to, as soon as possible, come to the ICU. Because we also know that the protocol-based uh, uh, care has been evolving over the years, and I think we, we have a much better focus on these patients nowadays. So, um, if we can move the hospital out to the patient, then I think it's okay to uh, keep on and stay and, stay and playing. But that's not realistic, at least not with the alternatives that we have available um, within the hospital nowadays. For sure, I mean, there's ECMO teams that goes out on the field. We may, might hear more about that later on. But I think um, to be able to perform an angiography in the field, well, we're not there yet. So how to do this? I think already when arriving at the scene, you need to have a mind setting. You can do an algorithm on that that the EMS team should be uh, considering uh, the patient for early transportation if they cannot reverse this cardiac arrest within, I would say, third, three cycles, as we talked about. But I think then you need to consider it already for beginning because it takes some time to prepare the patient for transport. But you should start preparing the patient for transport du during treatment. And you should be uh, able to maintain treatment during transport. And uh, I think that requires, at least in my world, mechanical CPR during transportation to be able to get uh, quality uh, on the transport. And you should also early alerting the hospital. Another thing that you, you, you that not discussed that much is that um, Patients with ongoing CPR could be a, a possible um, organ donator. This is a little bit uh, tricky. When should we say that the further treatment is futile? When should we move over to uh, maybe do some uh, preparation for retrograde perfusion, which you can do by putting in femoral arteries uh, and then have an aortic balloon occlusion, and below that you perfuse the organs. It's a thought, it's a tricky one, it's a tricky ethical issue, 
But I think it's at least in Sweden, where we have a lot of lack of organs, it should be considered. So, I think <coughs> scoop and round, which you see to the left, it's not what I recommend. So, uh, but at least I think we should treat and transport for some. That is very important if we are going to be able to move forward in the possibility of increasing survival. Basta. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present today. And I really look forward to this event, Stian, with you to discuss this uh, in public. We've discussed it many times and we'll continue doing so. And uh, it's uh, sometimes more pleasure, uh, sometimes less pleasure, but always fun. So should we transport patients in cardiac arrest? Now this is in cardiac arrest to hospital or stay on scene. So I am con in this pro-con discussion. And uh, now I think this uh, will be a rather cultivated uh, discussion uh, because uh, as uh, I find found out from Stian's presentation, we are not very far from e each other, although we put emphasis somewhat differently on different things. So no conflicts of interest. And um, well, the answer is no. I don't think so. And I will try to convince you why this is the case. And the reasons are that uh, first of all, CPR can be best delivered on scene. Even though you have good tools, good help, it's only the second best to do it during transportation. Also, hospitals actually has little to offer in a vast majority of cases. And there is so much enthusiasm in this in this uh, uh, field of uh, uh, research uh, and there is very little science, uh, solid science, so, but the enthusiasm has all very often tend to take over and we, pe we believe we can do much more than we, than we can. Also, transporting patients may be harmful, may be harmful to the patient, may be harmful to the ambulance crew and may be harmful to the public. We should not have uh, 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 these uh, ambulances crowding the streets, uh, according to my view. And definitely there are costs involved. I will not talk much about that. However, I will talk about ethics. Is it ethically correct to end your life in a, a mechanical device in an ambulance when the option or the alternative is to die dig dignified de death at home. So, today's combatant, who is he? The professor, Stian Rubertron, a strong man and uh, a good friend. So, our views are not always in line with each other, but, uh, uh, and this is something we will uh, uh, discuss today. So, again, should we transport patients in cardiac arrest to hospital? Well, in the old days, this was not a big issue, right? Because in the old days, you did not have, we did not have defibrillators uh, in the ambulances. We had to bring them to the hospitals in order to get, uh, give them treatment. The logic was clear. Today, though, we do have high-quality CPR on scene. Bystander, uh, uh, bystanders are there. AEDs are out there. We just need to find them more than we do today and use them and uh, we have very skilled ambulance crews. Now, if a patient receives ROSC, of course, he should be immediately transported to hospital. That is my view. So, why does this happen that is happening now? Uh, it's very clear that a change ha has occurred, and I think uh, uh, most of you can, can agree with me many more patients are transported to hospital in cardiac arrest, and this is a problem. I find it a problem, a significant problem. And why is it so? Well, uh, it is a misconception. There is so much enthusiasm and they're, uh, out there, especially in the ambulance uh, crews among them, and it's a misconception that hospitals can do more. 
it has also become an option since in some regions some or all ambulances are equipped with mechanical chest compression devices, which according to me is, has become a problem. So, in order to know what is the outcome of patients who do not have ROSC in the field, how many survive? Well, the best way of looking at that is to look at a country like Japan, where you cannot stop CPR in the field. You have to bring everyone to hospital. And this is a study of 400,000 consecutive patients from a national Japanese registry. And what they found was that the mon one month good outcome in 400,000 patients was a mere 0.49%. And probably some of these patients would have, would have had ROSC had they stayed on scene as well. So if you divide this into what the initial rhythms were, you see that the, the vast majority of them had VTVF. So yes, I agree with Stian, there are patients we, we should consider bringing into to hospital, but very few. And I will give you an example from our own hospital in Lund. I did this together with an enthusiast, Hans Olsson, I don't think he's here. And Molly Rundgren has been involved too. So we looked at the influx of patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest to the ED in Lund over the years. For many years it was around 30 per year. And they all had ROSC. Because you did not transport patients without ROSC. And eventually, um, this um, uh, treatment um, really improved for many years. And as you see, the number of patients increased, uh, and it has tripled two since 2002. And where you see the red asterisk, that is when a mechanical compression device was introduced in the ambulances. So it has a clear association with the introduction of these devices in the ambulances. But what happens, what happened to the number of patients admitted to an ICU? Well, yes, they increased too. But somewhere here, we, we reached a threshold. Patients keep on increasing the numbers we bring to hospital, but we have reached a thre threshold many years ago. And this is a problem, I think. It's, I think it's unethical to bring these patients to the hospital. They, uh, they should be allowed to die at home. We should not be so aggressive. And uh, I had a student uh, looking at uh, this uh, uh, recently. Patients uh, for during six years, we looked at all patients that came to the ED in Lund, and we looked at all of them, all their medical journals. It was a total of 639 patients, 402 of whom did not have ROSC. So what we wanted to see, how often was an intervention actually performed among these 402 patients? Because there was an option, right? They were in the ED. And there was an at intervention attempted in 37 cases, 9%. Four patients survived among them. Another four survived, but these four, they had ROSC. They would have received ROSC in the pre-hospital setting anyway they received ROSC in the uh, ED. So what were the interventions? These are 37 unique patients. Seven were angiographies uh, and five were PCIs. There were airway intervention in six, periocardiosynthesis in seven, thrombolysis in four and so on. And there were, as I said, four survivors, uh, but the intervention was considered pivotal in two of them. And those two were one angiography with PCI and one who received uh, internal pacing. So two survivors in six years, we brought more than 400 patients to the hospital. Think about it. And uh, even so, there are the termination of resuscitation rules. And if we were to use those rules, uh, these two patients would have been identified. For those of you who don't know them, uh, they were uh, originally 
designed uh, here in 2002, and then they have been validated in different cohorts. And um, it says that no ROSC, no shocks administered, and no, not witnessed by EMS personnel. You could leave this patient, uh, finish the, and terminate the resuscitation efforts on scene. Uh, universal TOR rule. So, a word about ethics. Uh, it's really a matter of avoiding unnecessary, uh, unnecessary harm and the ethical duty of proportionality. And when it comes to medical quantitative utility, you commonly use um, uh, uh, less than 1%. Uh, uh, if the, the gain is less than 1% for a medical intervention, you should consider withholding or withdrawing. But this can be discussed. And with regard to out of hospital cardiac arrest, my view is that we must avoid unnecessary harm. It's the patient that, it ma that matters. The right to a dignified death and the right to a dignified farewell uh, from the family. So that said, I will finish by showing this slide. In a majority of cases, we should <coughs> not transport patients, le leave them at home, let them die a dignified death. However, I agree with Stan, there are absolutely cases that we should transport. And these are, among others, ac some patients with accidental hypothermia, uh, drug overdose, refractory VF. And uh, also, of course, within a clinical trial, anything goes. So, uh, uh, yes, there are absolutely situations. And I believe uh, when we transport patients, we do need a mechanical device. Because without it, you can't transport to the hospital. Uh, and when you transport, you do it preferably to a hospital with ANGU facilities. Thank you very much. And uh, Stian, uh, it's not that far away, our views, but uh, so you're okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Hans, just stay where you are, and then your combatant uh, is arriving with his muscles. We've seen it now, Stan. So, uh, yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, <laughs> to sum what up, happened? I think, uh, Hans, you were very clear. Um, a very clear uh, con going to the hospital. And Stan, you were a little bit, maybe. Yeah, but it's, it's, it sounds like he's working for a funeral uh, uh, company. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Co no conflict okay. of interest yeah. the, oh, yeah. the floor is open for you combatants who will start uh, well it's your, t your turn no but I mean I, I don't think we're that far away from each other actually because I do think that um, uh, we have identified that it could not be for all um, there are definitely no um, uh, randomized controlled trials in this field yeah. yet to be seen and I I'm not sure how it should be constructed. The only thing that I know um, that I read, I mean, these TOR uh, things, I mean, there are patients that we don't identify with those for sure. And the question is, how, what kind of failure rate are we ex accepting on that? Also, you said that it's dangerous to have ambulances and, and running around in the streets high speed. I saw a, a at least that was from one of the articles that it was, I think that was the, the one that you sent to me because you wanted to have this uh, fight. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was one in out of 2,700 uh, um, ambul ambulance emergencies with cardiac arrest that you have an accident. Um, but if it, w if it was fatal or not, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, well, what can I say? Um, you have a lot of good uh, thoughts. Uh, but I think if we are going to move forward, um, I think we need to, uh, yeah, I think it, it could be done in a dignified way, even if you transport the patient into the hospital, because, well, so far, yes, but I think in the future, we, we will be able to, hopefully, to, to change things within the hospital. Yes, I mean, uh, I think the problem, I think, is that we introduce new concepts, new treatments, without really having assessed them. So uh, I'm very critical to that, and uh, I think we need to take one step back, backwards, and and really consider what are we doing in the pre-hospital setting. There is so much enthusiasm, and I don't want we want we don't we don't want to kill the enthusiasm. 
we want to uh, keep it, and but we need to do th something about what's happening right now. In, at our university hospital, we have devices in all ambulances. It, it's a problem because they are not used in a correct way. So we must have a discussion on when and how to use the devices and w who to transport. And I think this actually, uh, uh, this uh, discussion, and this is a sign of that, is actually, has actually started. And I think it's a very important uh, discussion to have. And we need to somewhat modify and improve uh, uh, this field. I think we have a questions from uh, the floor. And while you are getting ready, do we have any figures on how many today are left at home? for the funeral company. <laughs> we have, uh, we are actually... He was working for the business, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> we don't, uh, but there is data now from our national registry that we can retract from 2013 and onwards. There is data that can tell us uh, about it, and work is ongoing, actually. I can tell you from the Lund, uh, uh, Lund uh, uh, panorama that approximately 70% two out of three or 70% are brought to, to the hospital, and one of three or less uh, are they where, where they stay at home. Okay, Teresa, you have a question? I had a question. Is this on? Yep. Uh, so I think uh, we're all in agreement that we don't want to transport all patients in cardiac arrest. We're not going to transport the nine-year-old grandmother uh, that was found dead in her bed. Uh, but there is this group of patients that we feel like we should do something more for. Uh, the young patient with perhaps some sort of underlying cause that we can correct. Uh, and I think we agree on that, and then the strategies aren't really proven scientifically. We have ECMO, we have PCI, we don't really, we don't have great science to back them up, but we still want to do something. So, but then maybe, what is the question, should we bring these patients to the hospital or should we bring the hospital to these patients? So what's your stance on that? Should we? sort of scoop and run and try to get these young patients to the hospital as quick as possible? Or should we build up these systems with uh, pre-hospital anesthetists that go and, and put patients on ECMO in field? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I think we, we're going to hear a little bit more about ECMO later on. And Pierre Cali is here also. They know the Paris, uh, well, you know the Paris experience. So, um, uh, but that's not for everybody. I mean, there is no city in, in Sweden that well, maybe Stockholm. I think it's really tricky to, to move out with an ECMO team uh, on, on the scene. And if we don't even know uh, uh, the value of it yet, so I think it needs to be further evaluated. But when it comes to angiography and PCI, I mean, how should we be able to move that out in the field? I don't know yet. No. But, but we don't even know yet if it has any major impact, but I, I think so at least. Uh, uh, and I'm, I, I, I would be very surprised if we, I mean, if you look at, I mean, we know that time is muscle for sure. So, yes, no, I agree. I mean, in the end, it's a matter of resources. We can do anything if we have unlimited resources. But I agree with you, Stan. I don't think either that we, to a large extent, and not as a routine, until that has been proven beneficial. For example, the Paris experience is fantastic. We will hear more about it, where they bring the angu PCI to the patient or the ECMO at least, in the, in the pre-hospital setting, uh, to bring the patient to hospital for angio-PCI. So, uh, but that must be studied in, in trials. And before we know more, we can't tell you. And until we know more, we, we must be smart and do uh, as good as we can. And uh, really consider futility and consider ethics and allow people to die. But I think well. you, you're getting old. We are getting older. That's why we talk about ethics and futility and <laughs> things like that. But we need to keep up some enthusiasm <laughs> also because otherwise that has been driving medicine all the time. I mean, I've been working, you've been working in the ICU. It's wonderful. The first time I heard someone say I was not enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> my, no, my, but my friends, we have some questions have some for, questions for, questions for you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and I'll start with uh, this one, uh, alluding on what you ju were just talking about. Uh, does age matter in the decision to transport a patient in, a patient in out of hospital cardiac arrest to the hospital if they fulfill the potential inclusion criteria? As a root, I mean, we know we cannot use age as a limitation, although, but we know 
that age matters. And age is an independent factor for mm. uh, survival after out of hospital cardiac arrest. So yes, it matters, but we cannot use it except for within a study as a limitation. I agree. I mean, I think uh, it needs to be studied, but we have to set up some, uh, some kind of limits for, for what we do, because I mean, if we're going to study something, we need to have some limits. Mm. We need to identify the, the patient population. I think it's pretty good with you know, five minutes limit, witnessed, maybe age group below 65, maybe 70, depending on yes. the age of us. Yes, it's going up. Yeah. <laughs> so my, I, I, my final word, if I may, is really that, uh, yes, but we, we need to uh, calm down the enthusiasm and emphasize more the scientific uh, questions and answer them, perform the trials, get the answers, and, uh, and really uh, uh, highlight the ethical issues. Outcome is so poor here. We saw hardly very few patients survive if you bring them out, bring them to, to the hospital without ROSC. But to be able to do that, we need some enthusiasm. So I think we should, and you need to stretch the borders sometimes. I don't think it's unethical. In, um, Within a trial, nothing is yeah, unethical. No. Thank you. Okay, Steve. thank you. No. no, one more question okay. oh, from the audience. <laughs> um, education, quality, and experience of ambulance crew ver crews vary a lot. Uh, how, that, how do you think that influences whether to, to transport or to stay in place? For sure, I mean, I mean uh, that's, uh, that's a vital thing, I think, also. I mean, if you're not educated to perform a defibrillation, know when to uh, stop CPR or start CPR or perform good chest compressions, I mean, definitely. But, I mean, then I think if the, if the, if the EMS personnel is not educated enough, there is also too late to treat and transport. They need to be uh, very well trained and very well educated. Which is, it's a challenge, but it, it is something that is very important, I think. I, I agree with Stian, but I also think that the belief in the, uh, uh, the common belief is that many more patients survive. Look at the Japanese data. I think th those data must be shown. And the Japanese has always been uh, uh, only a few percent surviving. Yes. Because they, they are transporting dead people to the hospital. Yes. That's why they, I mean, it depends on what you put in. No, in but the these were all patients without ROSC. Yeah. How many had ROSC after, return, after uh, arrival in the hospital? 0.49%. I, I know that, but I mean, to compare Japan, Japan with Europe and Sweden and Scandinavia. Japan is a very enthusiastic country, Stan. Okay, yes. okay, <laughs> my friends. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Give them a big.